Hello, everyone. My name is uh, John McKay, and uh, I'm the Member of Parliament for Scarborough Guildwood. And uh, I have the extraordinary privilege as the Member of Parliament of meeting some pretty interesting people doing some pretty interesting things in Scarborough. Um, and many of those stories are very poorly told or not known at all. So we've had uh, we have had Wisdom Teddy on from the UTSC, one of the most extraordinary institutions at the University of Toronto. We've had um, Craig Stevenson on from Centennial College, uh, just doing, uh, again, extraordinary work at a Centennial and uh, Ann Buller at the, the uh, Scarborough Health Network, third largest health network in all of Ontario. And um, today my guest is uh, uh, Dion, uh, Mr. Dion. Um, yeah, Dolph is the uh, uh, is the uh, CEO, I guess, of the uh, Toronto Zoo, and um, uh, he uh, is uh, just a pretty excited guy because I think he just opened the zoo uh, recently to the public. So that's that's uh, I, I, we're going to get to that, but let me go back to your name, Dolph. So Dolph Dion. Now that's not a name you hear every day. So what's the, uh, the ethnic origin of Dolph Dion? Both, both my parents, thanks. Uh, they were born in Holland uh, and came over uh, shortly after the Second World War. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, named after my uncle and it's been, uh, it's been a pretty handy thing to have as far as having a name that stands out. I'm always easy to find online. <laughs> no kidding. No kidding. You don't run. You don't run into too many Dolphs these days. Oh, so, um, yeah, where where you. where were you born? Here in Canada, then? Yeah, I was born in Guelph, Ontario, actually, and just grew up on the other side of the city. And my dad uh, lived in Toronto, so I got to spend a lot of time in the city growing up. Oh, okay. So, uh, uh, when, what part of the city? Uh, Etobicoke, actually, so kind of uh, La Rose area, so a nice kind of suburban, you know, Scarborough's counterpart on the other side. Yes, as, as, well, as you know, Scarborough is the center of the universe, um, and if you didn't know that before you became the CEO of the zoo, you certainly know it now, and, um, and uh, you also have a, a claim to fame that you are now a resident of Scarborough Gilwood. It's true. Yeah, I get to uh, support a few of our local folks, and it's awfully nice having that seven-minute drive uh, to the zoo. <laughs> I imagine in the pandemic, the, the seven-minute drive has been cut down to about three. So, so um, yeah, like everyone else, it's quiet. Yeah. So you um, <clears throat> you went to uh, school in Etobicoke, and then you uh, went to three or four universities, uh, including Brock. So why'd you go to Brock? Uh, you know, I was I was looking to uh, go to a place that was away from home, but not too far from home. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that, that hour or so drive made it really convenient. And uh, yeah, I had a wonderful few years there playing lacrosse and uh, really a fun place to get to grow up. I had the uh, same uh, attitude when I went to Queens. It was, okay, I think it's time to move out of the parents' bedrooms. You know, it's a, <laughs> move on, get, move on with your life. So, but uh, then after that, you went, um, you went off to uh, Vancouver and did uh, some interesting stuff there. So uh, what happened in Vancouver? Well, it's been a pretty phenomenal ride for me. My, my career has always been about connecting people to nature and the natural world. And uh, I was in parks uh, for quite a while. Then I was at Royal Botanical Gardens in Hamilton. Uh, but when the opportunity to go out west came up, uh, as my good friend said, uh, Dolphy, it's fish. And I'd always <laughs> been a uh, home aquarist. I, I'd had, had fish tanks since I was a kid. And um, one of the amazing big conservation organizations and big canvases to paint on with a million guests a year uh, was, uh, was an opportunity I never dreamed of. Uh, so when I was offered that role, um, I, I picked up and moved out west and it would prove to be a great seven years. Well, you also uh, taught at a university there. So wh what were you teaching? Um, I had the opportunity uh, to teach tourism and hospitality and uh, working in this field, you know, a huge part of what we do is provide uh, guests these wondrous experiences and, and really provide people a break, a reprieve. We play a really important part uh, in people's social fabric. So 
uh, getting to share that. And, and quite frankly, I, I made that choice so I could uh, get back to learning. And the students were absolutely phenomenal. A lot of them at, uh, at that school uh, were new to Canada and uh, to get to learn about their enthusiasm and what got them excited about places uh, like our aquarium was so beneficial for me. It was just a, a wonderful experience. Mm. Well, that's, that is interesting. Now, uh, working at an aquarium creates some controversy, may I say. Um, there are certain people who think that, you know, aquariums have, uh, should be all closed up and, and all the, the fish and animals released. Um, I'm sure that you've had to uh, deal with that question from time to time. So what's the argument that uh, you would make as a obviously a big fan of aquariums that um, that uh, that they should remain and should be uh, should be well supported well you know it's a great discussion to have especially when you have a little bit of time like we do uh, first and foremost there's a huge distinction between accredited facilities um, that you know really put animal care at the forefront uh, and roadside attractions that are looking just to to make a dollar uh, so that's that's where I'd like to start as a key differentiator. And the piece with these accredited sites, when you look at their missions, and I'll speak to the mission uh, you know, at, uh, at the Toronto Zoo, connecting people, animals, and conservation science to fight extinction. Well, the key part to grab onto is that last piece, fighting extinction. It is not getting better out there for nature, mm. whether it's in our open ocean, whether it's anywhere on this planet. Uh, quite frankly, we have thoroughly eroded this whole concept of wild. Uh, between climate change, between microplastics, between other pollutants, and then just urbanization and urban sprawl. Um, you know, it is really a bad, bad state out there. You look at the WWF reports, the IUCN reports, we're losing animals and species at a faster rate than ever, at a time where we still haven't even cataloged them all. Um, so we need accredited zoos, aquariums, uh, museums, other conservation organizations to actually come together uh, to increase literacy on wildlife, to get people to care, so we have a hope of protecting some of these animals for future generations. And I gotta tell you, there's never been a more germane time for this argument. Uh, when you look at the roots of our pandemic, uh, healthy ecosystems are critical for healthy human beings and healthy human populations. And we have to make that link. And we have to reconcile that really uncomfortable reality that uh, we're not doing right by our natural world right now. Mm. I, um, I understand that the zoo actually has a um, program that preserves um, eggs and um, sperm and uh, of endangered species and sometimes even extinct species. Um, uh, tell me a bit about that that program. That sounds that that seems to be very consistent with the the argument that you're making that we uh, we are actually at the forefront of we meaning the zoo and the aquariums that are accredited aquariums um, are actually at the forefront of uh, uh, species preservation. Yeah, we're, we're finding the need for reproductive breeding or conservation breeding and, and reproductive support for a lot of species uh, becoming more and more common as, as they're facing pressure you know, when you think of introduced toxins and, and even locally, we hear about what's happening with amphibians where their reproductive rates are dry, dropping. Uh, there's a lot that's really impacting their ability to reproduce and maintain their population. So our team, um, we're getting ahead of the curve. So uh, they're actually freezing sperm, embryos, other living tissue. So we have that genetic material as a biobank, as, you know, essentially uh, Canada's biodiversity library. Um, so if we do get into a position where there's only a few of these animals left, uh, we don't have to work as hard as we did with, say, the California condor, where we get down to single-digit numbers of individuals, and you have to bring a population back that's so closely related, um, their long-term success very much could be in question because of that small amount of genetic material. Uh, so having that available uh, is amazing, and, and the success, success stories are happening. We actually had um, a wood bison born from sperm that was frozen since the early 1980s, and why right. that's a big deal is uh, that's genetic material from before some disease outbreaks they've had. Um, so that's clean genetic material. And when we talk about preserving the species, we can actually do breeding in human care, this conservation breeding, and help these wild populations recover uh, faster than ever. The other really interesting piece of work that's going on with that is uh, a lot of work around the endocrinology and what's going on with animals and doing remote monitoring. So we do a lot of work with animal feces and we now have technology to collect samples. And based on our animals in human care, we can tell you about caribou populations, their genetic makeup, uh, sorry, their, their um, 
gender makeup, as well as their, uh, their, if they're pregnant or not, and key indicators that are far more passive than traditional monitoring techniques. So uh, the work uh, by Dr. Gabriella Mastromonaco and her team is absolutely phenomenal. And this is an example of you know, a world-class research institute, the people literally writing the book on animal uh, reproductive physiology right here in Scarborough. Wow. So, uh, and these are the kinds of stories that people in Scarborough or Toronto or the GTA or Ontario for that matter, just simply don't know um, that there is some pretty, uh, pretty impressive uh, science going on. So who are the partners that you work with on, on your genetic material and, and other material? Oh, that, that's a huge list uh, from University of Guelph and University of Toronto to uh, University of Saskatchewan. Um, last time we looked at it, I believe we were, we were well in the double digits of partners. And, you know, that's a key piece with the conservation movement. Um, the types of changes we need to see happen to protect wild animals and wild spaces need a combination of, of government support, academic partners, and then everyday people making good choices uh, that really reflect a commitment to a world with wildlife uh, and wild spaces thriving. I think we all dream of that. And, and it's an issue that's closer to home than people realize. Uh, you talk about stories people don't know. Um, we have these amazing yellow chin turtles right here in our Rouge Valley called Blanding's turtles. Um, 10 years ago, we counted seven of them. Uh, in the past five years, Parks Canada, uh, Toronto Conservation Authority, uh, the provincial government and your zoo have released 400 of these animals. And we're gonna keep doing that for another 20 years. So we actually will have breeding populations still. Mm -hmm. uh, so that conservation work and those stories, yeah, we need to get out there so people understand, um, A, what's at risk, and B, the good things happening to save it. Yeah. Uh, I, I do remember the Blanding Turtle story a bit as to, uh, particularly for the uh, location issue of the uh, of the park. So you are sitting on the edge of the world's largest urban park, um, and um, and that uh, I think all of us are hoping will be a really good and useful partnership, possibly a unique partnership in the world. Tell me how that partnership is working these days. Oh, Parks Canada, they've been phenomenal. And, you know, you, you mentioned we're on the edge. Actually, we've, we've recently or we're in the last stages of completing an updated uh, agreement uh, that will actually have our entire zoo surrounded by the Rouge National Urban Park. Uh, we're turning over, I believe it's over 100 acres uh, to make sure that's part of the Rouge. And um, we're huge advocates for uh, large habitat assemblies and protecting those spaces because if you don't have those spaces there isn't anywhere for these wild animals to live uh, so it's a wonderful combination of mandates and and the federal government actually has several programs uh, that talk about conservation breeding and captive breeding as key elements of, al of animal care and reintroduction programs uh, so we just see it as just such an amazing partnership and to have them uh, have be at each other's front door another area of leadership for our community is we essentially are, are slowly assembling the pieces of a pretty amazing green conservation campus with our biodigester, our Parks Canada Welcome Centre and your Toronto Zoo all within minutes of each other. Hmm. So the, the biodigester is, is a bit of a story in and of itself, uh, known as uh, more colloquially as Zupu. Uh, tell us about that, uh, that project. So, so this was a really visionary project. Uh, the board, there's several folks who came together uh, on this and said, we can actually, um, through anaerobic processes, generate gas, which will produce electricity. Uh, and one of the key original sources was uh, feces poo from the zoo. And uh, since then, um, this idea has, has really evolved. It's been about seven years. And um, they're now scheduled to start uh, producing uh, electricity and tests as early as this October. It's, it's being built in the area formerly known as Parking Lot 4. And I think it's a really innovative approach to looking at our carbon footprint, looking at, at what we see as an energy source, and it's going to generate enough power for 500 homes. Uh, and that's a whole new approach compared to our traditional centralized uh, generating strategies. Yeah. Gee, imagine that uh, all that hot air coming out and uh, no politicians were involved. So. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, we had some. We had a lot of help along the way. I, I don't oh, know yeah. if we, sh we can let you guys completely outside of the start. Well, you know, politicians are uh, well known for the gases they produce. 
hopefully to reduce the carbon, hopefully we'll reduce the carbon footprint instead of increase of a carbon footprint. So, um, you've had some challenges recently, as have we all, uh, with respect to the pandemic. And, um, and I imagine that there's been a huge fall off in attendance, therefore a huge fall off on revenues, but you still have a lot of mouths to feed. Um, so tell us a bit about how uh, the zoo adjusted to um, the uh, reality of the pandemic. Yeah, well, I think it's one of those pieces that I think it's hit us all uh, really hard, but unlike a lot of facilities, uh, we don't have the luxury of just locking the doors and walking away. You know, we have a sacred duty to feed and care for these animals, uh, meeting their, their physical needs, whether that's feeding and cleaning, their mental needs and their enrichment and training. Uh, so none of that could stop. So right off the bat, our team took a very, uh, very aggressive approach as far as dividing up into two separate teams at our zoo and having some staff in reserve as well. So even if we did have an outbreak, uh, we had the depth to make sure, again, we could meet that duty to the animals. Uh, so that was uh, March 14th, I think the common date for everyone, you know, Friday the 13th, right. we made that decision. Uh, it was the Friday before March break, which traditionally would have been, you know, a very busy time for us. Uh, with the right weather, we would have see, been seeing 10,000 plus guests a day. Um, so, you know, definitely a shock to the system as we went uh, from operating Terra Lumina to hosting guests during the day to a full closure and, and what was ultimately one of our longest closures in our history. Uh, during that time, we operated with two teams, with our animal care staff, but also our, our life support and um, operation staff. When you think about it, we, you know, we keep a rainforest right here in Toronto. And during that period, we had snow, we had days that were 25. All that uh, needs to continue, as well as our amazing nutrition team, preparing diets for 450 different species, 5,000 individuals. So all that work uh, did continue. Uh, to your point of, of revenue, um, that was a substantial loss, and we were just blown away. The Toronto Zoo Wildlife Conservancy uh, launched a campaign, uh, Zoo Food for Life, and um, you know a pretty simple, a simple ask. You know, it costs about hundred thousand dollars a month uh, to feed the animals. You know, will you help us? And and we raised uh, well over six hundred thousand uh, dollars in in under six seven days. It was incredible. Ten thousand donors rallying to say we want to support our zoo because we realize you're not bringing in any parking revenue. Um, shortly after that, our team, you know, started, uh, started talking about what reopening would look like. And I think um, what we've seen socially is a lot of different attitudes and, and a lot of different approaches to getting out there. Some folks were just chomping at the bit to, once quarantine was lifted, to get out and we saw what happened in some parks. Uh, other folks really weren't, weren't interested in going out at all. And, and our team, for the first time in 45 years, came up with a strategy to actually operate a drive-through scenic safari uh, at our zoo. So that was uh, brought online uh, as soon as it was safe to do so when the province started changing the regulations and, and really has been amazing for us seeing, you know, I, I think at our max 1,100 vehicles in a day, uh, giving folks a really safe, physically different distance way to get through the zoo, a combination of driving on our walking path, service roads, zoomobile trails, and uh, a very different experience when people were really cooped up uh, so they welcome that and then in the past few weeks we have reopened to guests uh, starting with our members and, and now to ticketed guests and it's a very different experience uh, now you have to pre-book so you know I, when I wake up in the morning I have a pretty good idea who's going to come and visit our zoo that day how many and when uh, it's timed entry uh, it's a one-way trail to, to again make sure that distancing is there um, the mask protocols that the city's embraced uh, we certainly embraced as far as our indoor areas and um, a real commitment to cleaning. You're seeing a lot more staff whose, whose core job is, is making sure we're doing everything possible to send folks home safe. So, um, you know, we were really pleased with the uptake on our first weekend. Uh, it's been a little hotter the past few days, so not quite as many guests without our splash pad operating yet, uh, but um, we're getting, uh, getting the word out there that their zoo is ready and waiting and we're excited to get guests back. And, and what's, what's the risk to animals? Well, it actually depends very much on species, uh, particularly with primates, uh, felids, the, a lot of the cats, uh, swine, the pigs, uh, mustelids, so the otters, weasels, as well as bats, and one other group I'm missing, I'm sorry. Um, you know, there is, there's always risk, uh, you know, of, of viruses jumping in close proximity. Uh, it doesn't happen very frequently, but that is really the root of COVID-19 when we talk about wet markets and making that jump. 
So in those cases, our staff, our staff has traditionally uh, been wearing uh, personal protective equipment, wearing masks, um, but we've also changed the barriers. So in some cases, you can't get quite as close to those animals. And we've also ceased uh, the, the feeding or, or programs where people could actually get a little closer and have certain interactions. So again, changing our model to look after the well-being of all the animals as well as our guests. So that, that's, that's interesting because it's kind of an interspecies risk. Um, there's a, a risk to the animals, but there's also a, um, if you will, an animal risk to humans uh, the other way. Is, is, is that a fair assumption? I think the bigger risk, you know, I think what we've seen with the, with the, the reporting and, and data has shown, uh, we have seen uh, COVID-19 make a jump from people uh, to big cats. We saw that at a facility in the United States. Uh, I haven't heard of it making the jump back yet. Uh, but again, I think we're, we're going to err on the side of caution. And uh, we don't want to be the first ones to find those things out uh, by being careless. No, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So um, you've had um, you've had your hands full for the last last few months. Um, but uh, it, how, if you were to look, um, you know, say this time next year, and and let's work on the presumption there's a there's a vaccine or that there's some control element in the in COVID. Uh, what will be different about the zoo? Um, in terms of the, not only in terms of the visitor experience, but also how you manage the zoo um, if you return to whatever normal looks like this time next year. Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. And uh, I, I'm, there's a few different ways to approach it. I think one of the key assumptions uh, that, that I would need to put out there is, is our zoo would have been different next year with or without COVID. Um, you know, uh, I've been, with our zoo for it'll be two years in September and our board of management provided a pretty clear mandate to me um, that you know we wanted to evolve and our, and our zoo needed to catch up a little as far as our practices and um, this is a site that up until December of last year didn't have Wi-Fi anywhere on site um, hmm. when I actually wrote my cover letter uh, I talked a little bit about how I remember coming to the zoo in grade three and and it kind of looks a lot the same in some places and we need to fix that uh, so uh, we, we actually had a new strategic plan approved in February where we did update our mission, you know, the connecting people, animals, and conservation science to fight extinction. Um, but there's five key tenets, and, and two of them in particular, um, when you look at both uh, COVID-19 and the Black Lives Matter movement, um, I don't know if our, if our team and our, our board and our leadership could have done a better job um, really taking a look in the future and getting ahead of it. Um, one of our key tenets is our zoo and our community, and it highlights that our staff does not resemble the Scarborough area as much as it should. Um, we have a lot of work to do on diversity of, and inclusion and understanding where those barriers are, starting from who's visiting to who's volunteering to who's getting part-time jobs to who's getting full-time jobs. So um, that was one of the key tenants that we actually uh, picked out in late February. So that's something we're incredibly uh, committed to and we're going to be doing far better on. Uh, the other key element we talked about, how do we become the most technologically advanced zoo in the world in 10 years? So how do you go from a zoo that doesn't even have a Wi-Fi hot, wi hotspot to your guests to rethinking technology for guest experience? Yes. Uh, for buying tickets, of course. Uh, retail, that makes sense. We've seen all that before. But also our, our operations, you know, as far as how we're managed and most importantly, animal care and welfare. Um, how do we use this new camera technology to really monitor and make sure we're having a full understanding of what's going on with the animals in our care and how that's changing seasonally and building that data set. Uh, so really working closely with University of Toronto Scarborough, Centennial College, Ontario Tech, uh, and, and creating a framework of it and, and an innovation culture right here at our zoo uh, that we think can be exported anywhere in the world. Yeah, the, it, it's interesting to look at the constellation of really interesting and complementary institutions here in Scarborough. You know, you mentioned Centennial, UTSC, the Scarborough Health Network, the zoo, the park, um, and um, uh, there's a variety of really very interesting and collaborative initiatives going on, and in some measure, uh, they they uh, get focused on the zoo because the zoo is um, uh, got so many interesting things, if you will, going on both from a um, an animal species management, but also from uh, tourism, 
how you how you manage uh, uh, the experience of the visitor, that sort of thing. So um, uh, this is part of the reason why we've been doing these um, these uh, video casts or podcasts, or whatever you want to call them, uh, because uh, there are so many interesting things that, that are going on, and you are, uh, for you, <laughs> and it's good for you, you're at the center of this whole thing. Yeah. Well, well, we'd like to think we've got some amazing help and support in the community. Uh, we've seen that so far. You know, uh, Liz Buller and the Scarborough Health Network have been incredible and, and, you know, a great example of, you know, we talked about being closed but still caring. Our team, um, we're sewing masks for the hospital and, and they've been great supporters to us as far as advice during the pandemic. Uh, we're also, uh, we hosted 160 families on, on Saturday uh, from the health network. You know, our healthcare heroes have been doing so much for us. Um, we're also supported by some folks a little further afield that are, that are pretty amazing. Uh, the Mars Discovery Labs, uh, Venture Labs in Markham, uh, as well as the good folks in Ajax and Pickering. Uh, you know, our location is, is really phenomenal, actually, being kind of centered around yeah. all these groups. And you talk about that constellation, you know, those concentric circles uh, are key. And, and we have a few really important assets here. You know, starting with, uh, you know, last year, uh, we had 1.2 million guests. And these are folks who have declared an interest in, in nature, the natural world. And, you know, zoos, aquariums, science centers, museums, we're incredibly well trusted um, as, as folks who are going to give folks the straight goods that aren't going to try to be selling them stuff along the way. Um, so working in these collaborative partnerships and, and building this innovation ecosystem to really um, demonstrate the great work going on nearby. And, and we, imagine, we imagine our zoo playing a far larger role as far as when kids come here, they can see a lot of different futures for themselves. So um, we're currently in planning for a new uh, front entry, which we call our conservation campus. And we're looking at partners from the academic community and the green tech community. So imagine coming to the zoo and, and some kids might say, yeah, I dream of working with animals when I grow up, or I want to be a conservation researcher on Blanding's turtles. Or on their way out, they can see other folks who are, say, working in a tourism or hospitality program or working uh, in the life sciences. And, and again, have all those options in front of them reflected right in their backyard. And the, the other huge advantage you have, other than being in Scarborough, which I guess, as I pointed out many times, is the center of the universe. Um, the um, uh, the massive amount of land that is uh, accessible to you through the park and with the park to you. Uh, and I'm assuming a, a lot of interaction on, on that land and the, uh, the wisdom of uh, folks to have uh, set aside uh, that, um, that land running up and down the, uh, the Rouge River. I think that's uh, uh, I think that in um, generations to come, people will be very, very thankful that uh, there was uh, the, the foresight to do that. And uh, again, the zoo and the uh, the park are usually uh, cooperative in in uh, with each other. So we thank you for that. So anyway, we are going to have to leave that uh, there, um, in part because it's a uh, time driven. And we are uh, unable to go on forever, but there are so many things uh, that um, that uh, are going on. And I particularly appreciate you coming on, Dolph, to, to talk about uh, the uh, zoo. Uh, the excitement in your voice uh, is, um, is quite readily apparent, um, almost difficult to suppress, but one wouldn't want it suppressed. Um, so... Uh, I, uh, I uh, appreciate that you um, have made Scarborough your home. I appreciate that um, you are at, a, at the leading edge of some pretty interesting initiatives. And I also appreciate that um, there are a number of other institutions out here and people for that matter, uh, who are very keen on the success of the zoo. So thank you for for it. Um, I wouldn't quite call you a saint, maybe a secular saint, but not a saint. <laughs> yeah. No, a, a saint just doesn't work. I can see that. Oh. Yeah, anyway. not no, no, I, I, I could see that. No. Um, but with that, thank you again for the work you do. and Thank you for the contribution you make. And, um, and uh, we'll look forward to doing this again. Thanks again.
Thank you so much. And uh, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to the rest of my team uh, here at the zoo, our volunteers, also from the local community. Um, this has only been possible over the past year and a half because a lot of folks have bought into a, to a bigger idea and it's been, it's just been an incredible ride. Yeah. Well, you're right about that. Uh, there are a lot of people that have bought into the bigger idea and, um, and that idea seems to be working.